Oh, good. How are you guys doing today? You guys kind of alive? A little bit? I heard some people got like four or five hours of sleep. I woke up being so thankful to be alive today. Do you ever have days like that? For me, it's probably because I was rested. And if you didn't wake up feeling that way today, it might be because you're not rested. Hey, who's, whose first time is it here today? Who wasn't able to make it last night? Anyone? By a show of hands. Oh, awesome. Just a couple of people. Well, welcome to day two of the week in 2020. We're so glad that you guys are here. And I, and I know that some of us, you've been here before. This is your second or your third or your fourth year. And for others of us, it's our first year. Regardless of what year it is, I just want to challenge you with something. I, I think when we come to an event like this, it, it's really simple to want to be here because you feel like you need to get recharged. You feel like you need to get filled up. You want to be encouraged. And maybe it's like, it's like a fresh start. It's like, it's like a new year. It's like, I want, I want to experience God in a new way. I, I want to just have that, that feeling that, that brings me closer to God. Or maybe you're here and you're like, I just want to find out if God's even real, if he even exists. But regardless of what place you're in, while part of the reason we believe you're here is to get encouraged and to be filled up, Another part of it is that I don't want you to feel like every year you have to come back and you have to have this emotional experience to feel like you're in the presence of God. I, I, I want you to know that an event like this, what you can do with something like the weekend every year, and I challenge you to do this, is make this a point in your life that's like a line in the sand that says, I remember last year where I was at, and now that I'm back here, I can see that I'm in a different place and I'm a better human being, and it becomes this, this mile marker. It's like an anniversary, and so it's no longer something you're just, you're waiting for because you need to get filled up. It's you're walking away, and you're saying, I'm going to be different, and, and, I, and I want my life to be fuller so that next year when I come back here, it, it just marks a point in, in, in my life and in my story where I can say, look at how much God has done with me in 365 days of my life. It's just a little shift in perspective, but it could change everything. So before we start today, I just want to pray with you guys real quickly, and then we're going to dive in. Father, thank you so much for every single person that, that is in this room. You knew who was supposed to be here. You knew who was going to be here. And I ask that each and every one of us would have an encounter with you that would make the reality of your existence and your presence and your love so real, so evident, so undeniable that we walk away saying, God is good and he also made me to be good. We pray for healing. We pray for new life. We, we pray for shifted perspectives. And we just ask that this, this second day together um, would be a day that, that we can mark our calendars and we can look back and we can say, that was a day where something shifted inside of me. And, and, and because the world within me changed, I feel like the world around me has also changed. Pray that you would wrap every single one of us up in your love this morning and that you would be able to share something meaningful to our hearts as we talk about what it means to have full hearts. I pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Ah, I'm so excited for this morning. Um, we have so much to talk about. We have quite a conversation to have. So if you weren't here last night, or you're sleep deprived today and you're like, I don't even know what happened. I don't blame you. Um, I want to remind you that last night what we talked about is how Jesus stepped into human history to restore our humanity and to make us fully human again. You see, being human was never supposed to be a bad thing. To be a part of humanity is, is to be good. It's to recognize that the essence of love itself, God, lives inside of us and that what's deepest within us is good. And that was our original intention. That was our original design. And so one of the aspects of us that is made through, new through the healing of God is that we're given clear eyes. And, and, and just like we saw in the life of the blind man last night who was given this new story, clear eyes, uh, they allow us to see the world in color, to see the world with, with perfect vision. They, 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 they're the eyes that they give us the ability to really be able to see the beauty and the wonder of the world around us and they give us a hope and they give us a future because we can, we can look ahead and we can see just a piece of where God is trying to take us. There are eyes that give us responsibility to also lead other people through darkness. This is what it means to have clear eyes and it's one of God's intentions for us is to be able to see the world around us with a fresh perspective, with a new lens and to not feel like tomorrow is gonna be worse than today but 
to maybe in the first, for the first time in our lives feel like we have a sense of hope. And so this morning, I want to have a conversation with you about what it means to be given a new heart. So this morning, we're going to talk about full hearts. Last night, we, we talked a little bit about how this weekend we want to look at Jesus' life and encounters that he had with different people and the way that they, they walked away differently. And, and so we're going to talk about another one this morning. But before we do, I was thinking back to when I was 13, and it was, it was my first relationship ever, and it was a serious relationship to say the least. It was about, it was about six months long, and I, I had life figured out. I remember, you know, telling my mom, Mom, tonight I'm going to go on a date. Can you please drop me off and pick me up and maybe give me some money for the movie? And so it was, it was a serious relationship. I had really, like, stepped, stepped into manhood. Um, but about six months in, this relationship ended. I remember going over to her house, and she broke the news to me. And I tried to stay strong, but everything inside of me was, was breaking. And then it's like a movie happened, because I stepped outside. My mom was coming to, to pick me up, you know, because you can't drive at 13, not legally. And she... She picked me up, and I got in the car, and it just starts raining, and it's, it's like 6, 7 o'clock at night, and it's raining, and I'm like, the sky is crying because I am crying, and then she turns on the radio. She doesn't even say anything to me. She's like, hi, and she, she can't see that I'm, I'm broken, and so I just stare out the window with just tears streaming down my face, and then she turns on the radio, and I'll never forget the words that I heard. I'm still alive, but I'm barely breathing. And I just lost it. Break even by the script. There's nothing that will get you after a breakup more than break even coming on on the radio. And so I, I, I tried to hold it together. I was facing the window. She couldn't see how upset I was, how every part of my reality was devastated. And then we got to a stop sign and she asked that awful question you ask when someone around you is hurting that you think is going to fix everything. Hey, are you okay? And I look at her, and I just start, I just start weeping. And it's, it's like where you, you can't even figure out how to talk. And so I'm just like, yeah, this is broke up with me. And like, it's, it's not even coming out right. And, um, and the reality is, is that it's funny to me now, and it's easy to talk about because it's, it's comical. But in that moment, I feel like my heart was completely broken. And I know that maybe some of you have felt that way before. It could be in a relationship. It could be a tragedy in your life of some, other, of, of some other way. And I can look back and laugh at that. And some of us are going to have tragedies that we look back at and we'll never laugh about. But it, it, it's wild that every single human being at some point in our lives, we're going to experience a broken heart. Someone around us isn't going to be there anymore. Or we're not going to be able to be there for someone that we wanted to be. When we examine our lives and when we look at our experiences, our worst moments, our most tragic circumstances seem to be centered around a broken heart. Similarly, it, it, it seems that our best moments, our most joyful circumstances seem to be centered around a healed heart, a full heart. And, and I find it extraordinary how the human heart can be so resilient, that it, that it has this ability, it seems, to withstand and recover quickly from difficult conditions. Love will create in us this desire to, to give our hearts away and, and, and to have them be crushed and to have them be broken and to look beyond repair. But then somehow our hearts recover and they, they find a way to heal and to be restored. And we go through this, this cycle again and again and again and we search for a love that will heal everything inside of us. And I'm convinced what we're really pursuing, what we're really looking for is intimacy. It's both what we're most afraid of, but it's what we're, we're also looking for. Intimacy is simply having someone in your life that knows everything about you and they still love who you are. And you can freely be yourself. You can, you can have an intimate relationship with a friend in your life because they know the deepest, darkest parts of you and they still love you. you. You can have an intimate relationship with God because he already knows everything about you and, and he loves you more than anyone else could. And, and so this is what it's all about. This is what we're really looking for. And there's this movie that I saw last year. It came out about a year and a half ago. And... There's this scene in it that's, that's always stuck with me. And it, it's this movie about this girl who is like a cyborg. And she's living in this 
world set in the future and um, everyone who is, is a common person kind of lives on the ground, they live on the earth, but then there's this city in the sky and the ultimate goal is to go there because if you go there, you can have the life of your dreams and there's this boy that she starts to fall in love with and the more that she falls in love with him, the more she's willing to sacrifice because that's what love does to us and so there's this really moving scene that I want to watch with you real quick. Go ahead and um, look at the screen with me. We're going to watch, watch a quick scene. How much more do you need before you can go? 90K. 90K? I can make that in bounties. I'll just figure out who has the highest prices on their heads and then I'll take them out. No, I can't ask you to do that for me. I'd do whatever I had to for you. I'd give you whatever I have. What are you doing? I'd give you my heart. got an urn microreactor for a power supply, probably worth millions. With your connections, you can find a buyer. You can make enough for both of us to go to Solemn, and then we just find a cheap replacement. No. Come on, you buy and sell parts all day long. Don't just do things for people. No matter how good you think they are or how deserving they are. It's all or nothing with me. This is who I am. I know. It's okay. Put it back. <sighs> that was pretty intense, huh? <laughs> yeah, it was very intense. <laughs> I hope you think that's funny because that's you guys like every day. You're so dramatic about love. <laughs> Some of you are crying back there. You're like, I had a moment like that. But, it, but, it, but in all seriousness, I want you to think about the conversation that they had. It's so dramatic and it's, and it's ridiculous. But she says, I'd do whatever I had to for you. I'd give you my heart. And he says, don't just do things for people just because you think that they're good. And she says back to him, it's all or nothing with me. This is who I am. And, and I think this is such a beautiful picture of us because there's nothing quite as amazing and as beautiful as the sacrifices that you will make for love. A heart filled with love, it's, it's the best of us. It's the best of God. It's being so irrational in the way that you think because there's nothing you wouldn't give up for another person because you'd You'd, you'd give up everything for her, even her own life, so that he could have the dreams that he wanted to have. But I also think we know that there's another side to this, and, and it's really the worst of us. It's the antagonist of love, and it's hate. Hate is destructive and chaotic. Hate turns off all of the lights and suffocates everyone in the room. Hate is something that will eventually turn your heart black. It's destroyed the lives of countless people throughout human history. And, and there's nothing quite as tragic as a life that's filled with hate. See, the essence of hate is evil. And so hate is really, it's, it's the worst of us. And it's an enemy of God. So I want to look at what the scriptures observe about this, this contrast of love and hate, this, this tension going on inside of us. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, Who can understand the human heart? There is nothing else so deceitful. It is too sick to be healed. And when I read this, I feel everything but hope. How about you? If hope can only exist in the future, then it's words like this that make me feel I don't have one. I'm convinced that we don't have to look very hard to identify that there's, there's something wrong inside of us. I understand what a sick heart feels like. And when I crossed the line of faith and I decided to follow Jesus, I, I think one of the most difficult things was that the message of the church seemed to be centered around the brokenness of human beings without much of an emphasis around the goodness that God wants to pull out of us. And, and, and this, I think, is one of the church's greatest weaknesses over the last generation, that we have believed it's more essential to keep people from sinning rather than moving them towards a life focused on doing good, a life so full of doing good 
that there's no time left over to do what is wrong. We've been so obsessed with morality, trying to make Christians moral, instead of inspiring a life-changing relationship with Jesus where your default is no longer sin. Where Jesus helps you conquer the mess that's inside of you so that you're no longer held captive by sin, but you can instead open the cage, escape, and take the guilt and the shame and the sin and throw it in and say, this is your new home where you belong and you are now my prisoner. This is such an essential thing for us to grasp that we are inherently good and sin has made us look bad, but it's not the essence of us. It's not how God designed us. Jeremiah is sharing a reality, but it is not our future. Who can understand the human heart? There is nothing else so deceitful. It's too sick to be healed. So then I look at this verse, and I think about it in the context of the reality of Jesus in my life, and hope is born for the first time. Because even if you have a sick heart, you know the healer of all sick people. And he can heal everything inside of us. So this might be our starting point, but Ezekiel gives us the promise of God, the promise of our future. Ezekiel 36, 26 says, I will give you a new heart and I'll put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and I'll give you a heart of flesh. Before Jeremiah was making an observation, now God is talking, declaring a new reality inside of you and inside of me, a promise of hope. This is the new heart I want. How about you? I I, I want a heart that beats with the essence of goodness flowing through it. This is the heart that you were created to have. This is the heart that you were always meant to live with. And this heart isn't new because it's never existed before. It's new because we've never known it before. The new heart is really just the original heart that humanity was given. It's a heart of flesh that was turned to stone through a mistake, the first mistake. And you and me are living and the repercussions of those who came before us. You were born into a world of stone because we lost our way. And because we lost our way so long ago, ever since then, God has been fighting to help us reclaim what was lost, the image and the likeness of God himself, the goodness of God. When God made us, the first thing he declared is that it was very good. So now the old has become new because God is giving us a heart of flesh, only made possible because Jesus himself decided 2,000 years ago that you were worth the ultimate sacrifice for love, that it made sense that he would die if it meant that you and me could live. And so Jesus is saying to each and every single one of us, I would do anything for you. I would give you my heart. It's all or nothing with me. This is who I am. This is the reality of the way that God loves us. There's nothing, there's nothing that God wouldn't sacrifice to give us a life that matters. And that's the sacrifice that Jesus originally made for us. This is a new heart. It's the very heart of God put inside of you and me to restore our humanity, to make us incredibly spiritual and profoundly human. So this morning, I want to show you the lives of two very similar people, two similar backgrounds and encounters with Jesus but different hearts and different choices made. You see, the power to choose might be one of the most significant gifts God has ever given you because the choices you make today will create the world that we're living in tomorrow. Luke 18, beginning in verse 18, says, One day a Jewish nobleman of high standing posed this question to Jesus. Wonderful teacher, what must I do to be saved and to receive eternal life? Jesus answered, Why would you call me wonderful when there is only one who is wonderful, and that is God alone? You already know what is right and what the commandments teach. Do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not lie, and respectfully honor your father and your mother. The wealthy leader replied, these are the very things that I've been doing as long as I can remember. Ah, but Jesus said, there's still one thing you're missing in your life. What is that? Asked the man. You must go and sell everything that you own and give all the proceeds to the poor so that you will have eternal treasures. Then come and follow me. When the rich leader heard these words, he was devastated, for he was extremely wealthy. Jesus saw the disappointment and looking right at him said, it is next to impossible for those who have everything to enter into God's kingdom realm. Nothing could be harder. It could be compared to trying to stuff a rope through the eye of a needle. Those who heard this said, then who can be saved? Jesus responded, what appears humanly possible is more than possible 
with impossible for humans is more than possible with God. For God can do what man cannot. Peter said, Lord, see how we've left everything we have, our houses, our careers to follow you? And Jesus replied, listen to my words. Anyone who leaves his home behind and chooses God's kingdom realm over wife, children, parents, and family, it will come back to him many more times in this lifetime and in the age to come. He will inherit even more than that. He will inherit eternal life. Have you ever read a story in the Bible and just thought, I'm glad I didn't meet Jesus on that day? Like, this is just one of those moments where what Jesus says, it feels so harsh to me. And it's interesting because you never really know what kind of mood Jesus is going to be in. What are you going to get? Are you going to get the Jesus who says, I've never seen faith like this in all of Israel? Are you going to get the Jesus who is like, oh my gosh, how long must I be with this generation? And uh, I think there's a a very maybe ignorant but um, also bold disciple named Peter uh, because as he's following Jesus and they're going through life together, Peter always seems to want to speak up at the worst moments. And it doesn't usually end too well for him. And, and so I've never really related much to Peter. I was like, I, I relate to the disciples who are quiet, who don't say anything when Jesus asks a question. They're like, I don't know if I'm going to get this right or if I'm going to get this wrong, but I do not want to look stupid in front of you. I relate more to like maybe Bartholomew. He never really makes it into the book. They kind of like name him in the list of 12 disciples, and then he doesn't say anything. And, and, and I get it because what if Jesus rebukes you? Doesn't really sound like a fun day to me. So maybe like me, your first thought is, This is a harsh encounter, or that Jesus was asking something that really wasn't realistic. But we got to see what's happening, because this man says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And he he says that he's following the laws, he's following the commandments, and Jesus says, there's just one thing that you're missing. You need to give up everything. You need to sell all you have and then come and follow me. And it says that he's devastated, that he's so sad You see, I think all this starts in a kind of moment that each of us is looking for. We want to find out what's missing in our lives so we can find a meaningful life. He's asking Jesus, how do I have eternal life? But what you're missing may be something that you can't buy or you can't find or you can't earn. What if it's not something you need to find? What if it's someone you need to become? See, God doesn't want to steal everything you value in your life. He wants to give you a valuable life. And what was going on in this moment that that can sometimes be hard to see is that this man was full of so much greed that what he was holding on to was so important to him, this wealth, that when Jesus was sharing with him a new reality, the answer to his original question, how how do I get eternal life? Jesus was giving him the answer. What you value in life isn't really valuable. And I think sometimes we need to see this for what it is. You see, The life that we're living sometimes, we might think we're alive, but we're really just existing. And this man was existing, and and existence is is like barely holding on. Imagine being on the edge of a cliff, and existence is like holding on to a cliff with one hand. And in your other hand, you're holding on to whatever it is that's pulling you down, that's bringing you closer to falling. And it's something that hasn't ever brought you joy, but it's what you've been told is what you're supposed to pursue in this life. And, and Jesus, what you don't see that he's doing with this man, that he's doing in our lives, is he's standing over him and he's saying, give me your hand. I want to save you. I want you to experience the fullness of life. But if you're holding on to a cliff with one hand and the other arm is holding on to what you value so much, which for this man was his money, it was his greed, then what you don't realize is that you're going to have to let go. You're going to have to surrender what you're holding on to so that you can give Jesus your hand because it's your only free hand. And that's what's happening in this moment. Jesus is saying, let go of that. It's going to pull you down. I want to save you. Surrender what you have so you can give me your hand. And this is a process that we go through sometimes daily. You know, the life you want to live with God begins with surrendering what you're holding on so tightly to. That, that he knows is only pulling you closer to death so that you can take initiative and give Jesus your hand, but then here's the most important part. Jesus might be holding one of your hands, but he needs both to pull you up. And so then trust is required because you have to let go with that hand that is holding on to the edge of the cliff, and you have to be willing to put all of your weight on Jesus and give him your, your arm that you just let go of the cliff with and let him pull you up using his weight. And that requires trust. You have to believe that he's not going to let you fall. And so if we can't posture ourselves towards surrender, and then taking initiative, and then trusting Jesus with our lives, 
we will forever in this lifetime be on the edge of the cliff of existence, never pulled on to the ground, never pulled on to the plane of life that Jesus is, attending, is, is, is wanting us to live in. Existence is hanging on to the edge, but true life is found when Jesus is able to pull you up out of existence into a life that you never dreamed of. This is a life where you're, you're not afraid of falling anymore. You're caught up in the beauty and the wonder of the world around you and, and the fact that God is living inside of you. And then Jesus says it's next to impossible for those who have everything to enter God's kingdom realm. When Jesus says it's nearly impossible, it's not because of the wealth that this man had. It's because of his poverty. You see, if you believe you have everything, you really don't have any need for God. If every hole in your life is filled, God is irrelevant. You have to understand, you have to see there's something missing. It's the only reality that can make your life open enough for God to, to step into it. So this rich young ruler was really just a poor young slave. Everything that he owned really owned him. You see, true poverty isn't having nothing. True poverty is having an abundance of anything that doesn't fill up the holes inside of you. That's what poverty is. And what's going on here is that we're seeing the life of someone who's entitled and living for his own needs. You see, if you want to be wealthy, you need to know that possessions are not priceless. Relationships are. In, in God's economy, relationships are the most valuable commodity. And, and oftentimes, we want more relationships, but we get it all wrong. We think it's all about us. It's about finding people who can meet our needs instead of being the friend that everyone needs. You, you, you don't need to look for relationships where people can give you just what you need. You need to try to become the person for someone else that they need in their life. And then you'll find yourself surrounded by friends. But if all you ever do is go to every friendship, every relationship, taking and expecting that it's all about you, you'll completely miss the point of why God created relationships in the first place. And then there's this moment that's so tragic when you realize it, that Jesus says, give up everything, but then he says, and come follow me. And the only time in Jesus' life that he actually says, come follow me, is when he wants to change someone's life and he wants them to get the opportunity to step into the narrative of Jesus throughout human history. There's times that he heals people and he says, go and sin no more. There's times that he heals people and he says, hey, your faith has made you well, go. But to this man, he said, sell everything you own, show that you're all in, and then you can come and follow me. The only other people we ever have an account of him saying this to are the disciples. You see, I think this man maybe had an opportunity to become a, a part of Jesus' closest friends. And in that moment, he gave up an opportunity to do life with Jesus, and he walked away poorer than you or me could ever be. But then one chapter later, there's a different moment we see in a different life. Beginning in Luke 9, verse 1, it says, In the city of Jericho, there lived a very wealthy man named Zacchaeus. He was a supervisor over all the tax collectors. As Jesus made his way through the city, Zacchaeus was eager to see Jesus. He kept trying to get a look at him, but the crowds around Jesus were massive. Zacchaeus was a very short man, and he couldn't see over the heads of people, so he ran on ahead of everyone, and he climbed up a blossoming fig tree so that he could get a glimpse of Jesus. As he passed by, when Jesus got to that place, he looked up in the tree and saw Zacchaeus and said, Zacchaeus, hurry on down, for I am appointed to stay at your house today. So he scurried down the tree, and he came face to face with Jesus. As Jesus left to go with Zacchaeus, many in the crowd complained, look at this, of all the people to have dinner with, he's going to the house of a crook. Zacchaeus joyously welcomed Jesus and was amazed over his gracious visit to his home. And then he stood in front of everyone, and he stood in front of the Lord, and he said, Half of all that I own I will give to the poor, and Lord, if I have cheated anyone, I promise to pay it back four times as much as I stole. Jesus said to him, This shows that today life has come to you and your household, for you are a true son of Abraham. The Son of Man has come to seek out and to give life to those who are lost. And there's something beautiful about this moment because Zacchaeus was a social outcast. Jesus had gone from being outside of the city at some point talking to this rich young ruler to now inside the city of Jericho, and he has this encounter with Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus is a chief tax collector. His life is predicated on stealing from other people. He has made a decision that greed is more important than relationships, that money is more of a value than people. And because of his choices, he's been left as an isolated outcast, despised by so many people, so many people whose lives he's ruined. 
then no one wants to give him the chance to see someone so beautiful because he's created so much ugliness in their life. He chose a life in isolation because everyone that got close to him got burned. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever felt like the closer you got to someone, the more they hurt you? Have you ever been the person that someone got close to and you realized that they walked away so hurt that you felt like that relationship couldn't be repaired? And it can be devastating. And sometimes you can feel like what you need is a reset. You need a fresh start. And what's interesting is I've met a lot of people who need a fresh start. I've said it before in my life. And I think there's two kinds of people that say this. There's two kinds of people because there's the people who they need a fresh start because they do need to reset and they need a change. And it actually it gives them the perspective they need to continue on in their life and to move maybe into a more meaningful life. But then I know people who seem to be addicted to this idea of a fresh start. I know people who move from place to place, from relationship to relationship, from conversation to conversation, and nothing ever changes. And, and, and the reality is, is, is that if you always need a fresh start, you become this transient person, this transient being, and you're moving from place to place and relationship to relationship and conversation to conversation, constantly moving but going nowhere. Because you cannot find the change you're looking for if you continue to stay the same. You see, if every relationship in your life ends at the exact same place, exact same conversation, exact same fight, exact same burned bridge, at some point we have to take responsibility and say, it's not just everyone else. It might be me. And I don't need a fresh start. I need to change who I am so that I can make it further in relationships and not break down at the exact same place every single time. And, and so Zacchaeus, he needed a fresh start. And, and it says that he was eager to see Jesus. You see, he'd heard the whispers and the rumors of who Jesus was. He was convinced that maybe, maybe this could be it. If, if Jesus accepts other tax collectors and sinners and people who have been outcasts, maybe this is my fresh start. Maybe if I see Jesus, something inside of me will change and I can finally have a relationship that isn't destroyed and devastated in the wake of who I am as a person. And so Zacchaeus is just eager to see Jesus, hoping that maybe something could change in his life. And then it says that he couldn't see through the crowd, that he was too short, too small of a man. And so he's desperate. And he climbs up this blossoming fig tree. And as he climbs up this tree, he's given a new perspective. But I, I, I'm just amazed that he ran ahead. Because what Zacchaeus was really saying in that moment is, I'm not going to wait to be included in the present. I'm going to look at the trajectory of where I believe God is moving, and I'm going to go there, and that's where I'm going to meet him. And I think, you know, there's this common phrase in the church, God will meet you where you're at, and there's so much truth to that. But what if God is only supposed to meet us where we're at when we're unaware of him, when we don't know who we are, when we're lost? What if once you come to know Jesus or choose to follow him, what if part of your responsibility in that is that now that you're connected to God, you need to move where you believe Jesus is going and you need to meet him there. Not just wait for God to meet you where you're at, but to go where you believe God is trying to lead you. Jesus only met Zacchaeus where he was at because he went to where he believed Jesus was going. Zacchaeus said in that moment, I'm going to go towards the future. And I'm going to meet you there because there's no chance I can find you in my present. And then something unexpected happens. Jesus gets to where Zacchaeus is at and he looks up at him and he sees him. I think Zacchaeus just wanted to see Jesus. But I don't think he was expecting that Jesus was going to see him. This might be the first time that he felt seen in his entire life. And you may not be looking for God, but I want you to know something. God is looking for you. You might feel invisible and unseen by the people around you, but you need to be convinced that God sees you. You might not believe in God yet, but you need to know that God believes in you. Jesus looks up and he sees Zacchaeus. And then he tells him to hurry on down, for I'm appointed to come stay at your house today. And this says so much about what kind of friend Jesus is, because we all have that friend that just invites themselves over. They just show up at your door. 
You say you're going to something, they're like, can I come? Or they just show up. You, you, you say you're going to have a birthday party, and they're like, what time? What day? We all have a friend who invites themselves into our lives. They invite themselves into a hangout. And um, if you can't think of that friend right now, and you're like, I don't really have a friend like that, it's because you are that friend. <laughs> and this is what kind of friend Jesus ends up being. Jesus is the friend who decides to invite himself into Zacchaeus' home. I had a friend, um, and I still do have this friend. He's actually a really good friend of mine. And he would do this all throughout high school. He was infamous. He'd show up at my house with a sleeping bag, and I'd open the door, and he'd just walk right in. He'd be like, hey, bro, staying the night tonight. Uh, he'd come over, and he'd be like, hey, are we doing Modern Warfare 2 or Modern Warfare 3? And, and it was so funny because it just became this, this expectant thing that Corey was going to show up at my house unannounced, unexpected, and we were going to hang out. And, and thankfully, I wanted to hang out with him because I know nothing's more awkward than the person you don't want to hang out showing up, right? And then this moment happens that um, if, this is any, if there's anything that you understand this morning, I want you to see this. It's so beautiful the way that the scriptures make this come alive for us. It says that he scurried down the tree and he came face to face with Jesus. That he joyously welcomed Jesus and he was amazed over his gracious visit to his home. Because he had gratitude. He was so thankful for the reality of, of Jesus wanting to be a part of his life. And then he stood in front of the Lord and he said, Half of all that I own I will give to the poor. And if I've cheated anyone, I promise to pay back four times over again. One encounter can change everything in your life. Everything around Zacchaeus changed because everything inside of him changed. Jesus saw him. And then he stood face to face with Jesus himself. And, and, and in that moment, what happened is that he saw eyes that are full of love and it changed something inside of him. His heart got two sizes bigger. <laughs> and what happens in this moment is that hate inside of Zacchaeus was transformed into love. That greed transformed into generosity. And because of a moment with Jesus, Zacchaeus becomes a very poor man. Right there, he makes a declaration that my life has felt so wasted because I have all the wealth in the city and I think I'm the poorest man here. And he makes a decision to give away half of everything that he owns to the poor to make his city wealthier, to get people off the streets, to help people live a better life. And then he says, and anyone that I wronged, I promise to pay back four times more. That is a loan with a lot of interest. Jesus, Jesus is witnessing a moment in the life of Zacchaeus where he is saying, I'm a changed man right here. Jesus, I want you to see that you have brought out the best in me. And I don't even know what I'm saying right now. Zacchaeus only has one line in the entire Bible. He says this. We hear about what Zacchaeus did and where Zacchaeus went and how he saw Jesus and how Jesus went to his home. And then he says, Half of all that I own I give to the poor, and I'll pay back four times anyone who I've wronged. That's the only thing that Zacchaeus says in the entire Bible. But can I tell you that for me, it, it, it illuminates his character. His life was worth more than he could imagine for the first time ever because he made it valuable, seeing how valuable it was to Jesus. And that's what kind of life I want you to live. That if someone only had one sentence to explain you, it would share the character of who you are in such a way that anyone who heard it would have a complete and vivid picture of what kind of human being you are. And, and that's what you see. The Zacchaeus says one thing, but I hope for you it also changes the way that you see this man. This is what happens when love transforms you from the inside out. That's what's going on right now. We want to change people through conversation, and we, we just want to change people through trying to tell them how to do the right thing and telling them you need to knock it off and you need to stop it. And we have people in our lives that are really close to us that haven't stepped out of the lifestyle that we want them to step into. And we have family members and relationships that we just want them to get along and we just want them to figure it out and we want them to stop messing up. And what we don't understand is that love is what transforms a person. Love will change you from the inside out. It will shift your entire economy of priorities. If you love, you will change the world around you. I have seen the most arrogant people become the most humble because love changes everything. I've seen people fall in love 
And you'll see guys who are incredibly arrogant become so humble and become so generous for the first time in their life. They start spending all their paychecks on that one girl, taking her to movies, buying dead things called flowers. Love will make us crazy. Love will make us so crazy, it will change everything inside of us so that we can see beyond us and we think of a person as more valuable than maybe even ourselves and we'll start to give up things and sacrifice for them because our world's turned upside down. But you know what turns your world upside down even more than that? It's being transformed by a love that God has for you, that only God has for you. And it's a love that will shift your economy of priorities again so that people, not just your girlfriend, not just your boyfriend, not just the person you have a crush on, but people, relationships in your life, all of them will become so important that you will see the world the way Jesus sees the world. You will have his economy of priorities. You will say, people are my number one value, and your life will show that because every time you step into someone's story, their life gets better and better because the love that they didn't have from their mom or their dad, the love that they didn't have from their friends, the love that they really just didn't feel from the world. Like if I was to disappear tomorrow, no one would even notice. That void was filled because you stepped into their life and they finally felt like their life was meaningful, that they would be missed if they were gone. I want you to feel that that's the role that you have in someone else's life. I want you to be surrounded by people that you feel like love you so deeply that you owe it to them to stay alive and to keep living because you have so much hope. Love is truly the transformative power that can shift everything inside of us. And once this world inside of us changes, the world around us begins to look so much different. And, and this is the power of love, is that love can actually, it can change everything. Jesus' love will shift even more than that because people will become your number one value. And you won't have to try to be selfless. You will be so filled up with love that you will be overflowing and it will pour out onto everyone that's around you. Some of us aren't giving away enough love because we don't believe we have enough inside of us. And if we give out of our, our lack of, we will have nothing. But love from Jesus flowing through you, transforming you from the inside out, it will fill you up so much that you won't be able to help trying to give it all away and you'll still have too much. That's this, the kind of love that we were created to live in, in a relationship with Jesus. And then Jesus tells him, life has come to you and your family. Everything the rich man tried to buy, Zacchaeus got freely. He chose to step out of his poverty into the richness and the fullness of love. And so just a quick contrast. The young ruler approached Jesus out of arrogance. Zacchaeus approached him out of humility. The, the intention of the young ruler was validation. Zacchaeus' intention with Jesus was transformation. The young ruler's encounter ended in tragedy. Zacchaeus' encounter with Jesus ended in intimacy. The young ruler was commanded by Jesus to sacrifice and follow him. Zacchaeus was only told to come down. Jesus' response to the young ruler was, it's almost impossible for you to enter God's kingdom. His response to Zacchaeus is, you are now a part of God's kingdom. The choices that you make today have a significant impact on the life that you will be living tomorrow. Zacchaeus might have felt like his life was wasted, but the day that he met Jesus, he gave away everything and he became the poorest man in the city, literally. But you know what I think? I think a lot of those people gave back and provided for Zacchaeus and his family. I think he made his city better. I think that when he went to return the money to the people who he'd stolen from and he gave them four times more, I think they asked him, why are you doing this? And I know what he said. He said, I met a man named Jesus and he filled up my heart and he changed something inside of me. And, it, and in that moment, I thought of you and I thought, I need to give him back everything. And I think it opened up a conversation about talking about Jesus. I think a lot of people in Jericho met Jesus because Zacchaeus had. I think a lot of people in Jericho met Jesus because Zacchaeus told them about him. And I think in our lives, we have so many choices to make every day. I want you to choose 
a life of abundance. I want you to choose a life of generosity. Don't come to Jesus just asking him what he can do for you. And when he asks you for something, know that he's trying to save your life, not take it away. He's not trying to take everything that you value in your life. He's trying to give you a valuable life. Chase Jesus. Go to where you believe he is going to go and you will meet him there. An encounter with Jesus can transform your life and you are living in a reality where you could have Jesus change your life every day over and over again. If you're looking for the answer, it can only be found in love. If you're looking for healing, it's found in love. If you wanna be a better friend and you're trying so hard and it's not working, it's because you're not letting the love that God has for you flow in and through you out to other people. Loving shouldn't be something you have to try to do. It should be something you can't help but do. It becomes instinctual. It becomes a part of who you are. Jesus is trying to give each and every one of us a new heart. So today, if you feel like you have that heart of stone and you want that heart of flesh, you feel like your heart is cold, you feel like it's not alive, and you, and you want your heart to be beating, you want your heart to be pumping, you want to feel that you're alive and you want to feel so full of love, you want to feel that you wouldn't hesitate for a moment to say, I give you my heart, it's all or nothing with me, this is who I am. If that's a reality that you want in your life and you don't feel like you have that this morning, I just wanna pray that God would give us that heart because it's not an idea posted in the Bible. It's a promise that God gives and God never breaks a promise. So if you guys would bow your heads and close your eyes with me real quick. If you're here today and you're just saying, I want a new heart. I don't want a heart of stone, I want a heart of flesh. I want the heart that I was always created to have. I want a new heart that gives me new life. I just want you to say a quick prayer with me. I just want you to, in your own heart, in your own voice, in your own whisper, whatever you choose, I just want you to say, Jesus, give me a new heart. Jesus, give me a new heart. And if you're here and you also wanna give him your life, just say, Jesus, I give you my life. It's that easy, it's that simple. It's not all that you and God need to talk about right now, but it is, it is the start. Just say, Jesus, I want a new heart. And this is just you crossing into new territory in your relationship with Jesus saying, I want to live a life that's full of love. I wanna be known by love. And if you're here and you're saying, Jesus, I give you my life, then let me just tell you that in this moment, he is putting his life inside of you. So I wanna pray for us real quick with your eyes still closed. God, I thank you that your original intention for us was to have a heart of flesh. Thank you that you have fought the fight, needed to win back our hearts when they were turned to stone. Thank you for working all through human history and fighting for love and sacrificing more than we could ever imagine just so we could experience a love that will change us forever. And Jesus, make this reality in our life so real. Make our hearts so alive that it becomes an extension of who you are, that we become a group of people that love each other so well, that love those around us so well, that it's undeniable that something new is going on inside of us. God, we ask for new hearts, just like we asked for clear eyes last night. And we ask for new faith to just see you in a new way, to see you in a new light and to love you to a new capacity. God, we thank you for everything you're doing in this space. We thank you for everything that you're doing inside of us. I know that there's conversations going on with God right now. There's things that you felt this morning. And God, thank you for making it so undeniable that that's you inside of us, speaking to us, moving through us. We thank you so much for who you are and the heart that you've given us, the life that you've given us. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Can we just thank God for this morning? We're gonna go back into one song of worship and I'll see you tonight talking about a new future. Do not miss tonight. Do not miss an opportunity to, to, to hear about how nothing in your life has been wasted, even if you feel like it's all been a wash. Jesus has given us clear eyes. He's given us full hearts. Let's talk tonight about he's given us a new future.